so the presentation title here is Spatial Reasoning, What Are We Up To? I wanted to give a bit more context to the paper. Uh, so I'm Carl Schultz, as I was introduced. My co-author is Michael Reich. And we're from the universities of Münster and Bremen in Germany. Okay, so just an outline of the talk. First I'll talk about uh, a topic called Declarative Spatial Reasoning. I'll then talk about uh, spatial reasoning in particular, uh, just to make sure that everyone understands all these sort of weird terms that we're going to be using. I'll then talk about a particular method for spatial reasoning called numerical optimization. So that was the focus of this particular paper. Uh, and then I'll wrap up with some applications of this spatial system that we've been developing. Can you hear me down the back? Is it, is it clear enough? Okay, so uh, part one, declarative spatial reasoning. Uh, so if, if we just sort of reflect on what we're all trying to do, we're trying to use KR languages in various domains. And a lot of these domains have special components that are intrinsic to these domains. So on the top left, we've got some geographic information system type application. Maybe we're trying to interpret satellite photos, something like that. Maybe we want to recognize deforestation. In the top right, we've got an example of um, architectural design. So maybe someone's trying to design a building. Uh, there, of course, there's a lot of special information, special rules, special components. Through the middle, this is an example of, of smart meeting cinematography. Um, so we could imagine, perhaps I would put a connect device here and sort of watch you people and then try to automatically generate minutes of uh, the event. And so then I would need rules that would be recognizing activities when someone's raising their hand and so on, which would also be spatial, right, raising hands. Uh, and finally, maybe we're using computer vision to detect issues uh, at the airport. So we want to make sure that certain um, luggage is being collected correctly and so on. Okay, so there's a special component to all of these different application domains. And uh, just to be clear, so it's, uh, when we're talking about space, it's not only numerical information uh, that we're interested in. So uh, numerical information might be something like turn 36.7 degrees counterclockwise compared to something like turn left into the street near the red building. Okay, so that, that distinction is important. Uh, I won't give some formal definition at the moment. It's fine just to, to sort of loosely understand this intuitive idea of the distinction between numerical spatial information and qualitative spatial information. Other terms like inside, next to, above are qualitative in nature. So there's a lot of different aspects of space that we are interested in. People have been studying for a long time. So some keywords, which you, you may or may not have heard of before, so topology, how regions uh, have contact with each other, mariology, the so relationships between parts and holes, uh, various orientation relations, so left, right, uh, and so on, front, back, north, south, uh, that would be cardinal directions. Distance size, so things being near or farther away, larger and smaller, uh, and shape. Okay, And this has led to a lot of different approaches for dealing with various different aspects of space. We could call this the qualitative spatial zoo. And so many different methods have been developed, and none of them are really finding their way into the applications. Right. So uh, why is that? That's, a, that's the challenge. So we could then rephrase the question as, by what means may specialized spatial representation and reasoning techniques be integrated within general knowledge representa representation and reasoning frameworks within artificial intelligence, right? So all the, the people doing work in spatial reasoning really need to get their systems and methods into KR languages so that they, they can be applied in practice, and applied, connected with rules, and so on. Okay, so what does this mean in practice? So we can use Prolog as an example, a sneak peek of what this could look like in the future. Okay, so you're, you, I guess everyone here is pretty familiar with Prolog. We would have facts and rules. We've seen these before yesterday. So facts like um, Trude is the mother of Sally, Tom is the father of Sally. Rules, uh, so X is a sibling of Y. If there's a Z that's a parent of Z and Y, uh, and X and Y are not the same. Uh, X is a parent of Y, if X is a father of, uh, of Y, and so on. Okay, we have facts and rules, and then we can ask questions in Prolog, right? So we can ask, is Sally a sibling of Erica? That's a yes or no. Is Sally a parent of Erica? And so on. Okay, so um, what other questions might 
would be interested in asking. Perhaps we're interested in asking about uh, special relations. So for example, maybe we're interested in asking about uh, cubes. So we've got three cubes, A, B, and C. And we have facts, so we know that A is inside B, and B is touching C. And maybe we want to ask questions about what sort of special relations could hold between A and C. Then we might expect such a system to come up with these different topological relations of the way that regions can contact each other. The different possibilities, so it can be disconnected or touching. More than that, we might want, for each of these different cases, we might want a diagram or some sort of what we would call a configuration that satisfies that scenario. So here on the left, we've got A being inside B, and B is touching C, but A is disconnected from C, right? Don't share any points. On the right, A is still inside B, B is touching C, and A is also touching C. Okay, so what would that look like in a language like Prolog? So here we might say we've got three cubes, A, B, and C. And important, importantly, we don't specify any numerical coordinates, right? So we're talking about any cube, A, B, and C, such that A is inside B, B is disconnected from C, and then we ask what relation holds between A and C, and then Prolog might give disconnected, we can ask for more solutions, and so on. So that's what the sort of thing that we would like to have. Okay, and there are many other aspects of space that we will want to reason about in, this, in the same way, right? We might have some topological relations, some orientation relations, some size relations. Um, so I'll just quickly run through these. So topology, disconnected, touching, overlapping, being inside, orientation, front, left, right, uh, distance, near, far, and size, large or small. Uh, so then if we apply this to a domain, maybe we're doing some very simple product design scenario. So I found this nice little sketch that some clever artists did, and I thought it was quite cute. And I was wondering how could it, what, what sort of qualitative relations are important in this design. And so I just threw down a number of points and thought about what relations hold between these. Uh, so here we've got some object which is the base and some object which is a bar and a joint and so on. And I imposed the relations, the joint, first joint is to the left of that bar, second joint is to the left of that bar. We end up with our diagram, there's a few more constraints, I added some, some lengths and so on. Uh, maybe we then want to interact with this diagram, right? So we want the system to understand space enough to not give, not permit any inconsistent spatial relations. We want it to generate a diagram, but we might also then want to play with that diagram. Okay, so. That might look something like this. So we have our lamp, and I'm, I'm grabbing some of the points, and I'm moving it around. And at all times, as I move it, the system should maintain all of the qualitative constraints that I've specified. Right? Oh, I'm trying to push it around, trying to get this thing to the right, but it doesn't work because I said left. Moving the lamp inside the shade, and so on. Okay. Okay, so again, in, in Prolog, it might look something like this. We would declare a number of uh, different objects, so saying that the base is a point, um, the bar one is a line between two given points, and so on. Uh, model the shade as a circle. Fix some of the points, so we want to fix the, the base at point zero, zero, for example. Uh, fix the length of certain bars. And then specify our qualitative relations, so certain objects to the left and right, and so on. Then we could ask our question, so is it, uh, what is the relation between the lamp and the bar? And so the system could say left. If we ask for more solutions, then the system could itself update this diagram, right? So another solution is that the lamp is in front of this line segment. And so then it could modify that diagram for us to show us what, it's, what sort of scenario it's talking about. Okay, so that's sort of the vision, right? And so this system... Uh, that I've, I've been showing now, we've called CLP bracket QS. So this, this is from um, constraint logic programming over qualitative spatial domains. That's that's sort of weird jumble of, of letters. And that's an example of a declarative spatial reasoning system. Just one example. Okay, so basic interpretation. Um, declarative spatial reasoning denotes the ability of declarative programming frameworks in AI to handle spatial objects and the spatial relationships among them as native entities in the same way as has been handled with integers and reals and so on. So that was that, that's perhaps some driving motivation. Okay, 
So I'll just talk a little bit more about what I mean exactly about uh, by spatial reasoning. Okay, and so I'll, I'll just start with a little question. So how many uh, same sized spheres can be all touching each other at the same time? So not overlapping, but just touching, all touching at their boundaries. So if you think for a second, um, for sure at least two, right? Maybe three, four, maybe five, right? So this is a spatial puzzle solving. We could formulate this in a prolog query. So we've got a list of five spheres that are all the same size and they're all touching each other. Then we would hit uh, enter here. And in this case, it's false. So five is uh, the limit. And then we would ask for the system to produce these examples. So here, yeah, here's four. So you would lie three down and then pop one on top. That's how you get four. Five, it's a little bit hard to see but uh, if I put it here, these two on the side are sort of overlapping each other, right? Okay. okay, so we can represent such spatial problems as graphs. The nodes in our graphs uh, represent the objects. Each object belongs to a spatial domain or a type, so uh, very open about the type, so there's a lot of different things we could want to talk about, circles and points and lines polygons, different types of polygons, concave and convex, and so on, squares. Uh, of course, also 3D objects. We're also interested in 3D spatial domains, right? So 3D points and spheres and so on. Okay, so uh, the edges between nodes represent relations between objects. So here we're saying that a square A intersects with a square B. And uh, it's important to note that this is a purely qualitative description of a scenario, right? So where are A and B? We can't say for sure numerically, and how big are A and B, we don't know. All we know is that there's two squares and they're intersecting each other. Or at least that's what this graph is describing. Okay, so we could add uh, maybe some numerical information. So here we've got, we've said that the square must be at point zero, zero, so maybe the bottom left of the square has to be at zero, zero, with size five. And B, we haven't said where B is, but we've said it's, it's the same size as A. Uh, and so um, this is sort of a mixed qualitative numerical problem. Uh, where is B? We don't know. All we know again is that they intersect. And we might, so w what are some tasks we might want to do with this? Maybe we want to know whether this is still consistent, right? Okay, so by consistent, we mean that there exists at least one spatial configuration of the objects that satisfies all of the constraints at the same time. Okay, so consistency is a yes or no question. Instantiation then is generating a configuration that satisfies all of the constraints at the same time. And interactive geometry is this task or this, this child problem where we start with a consistent configuration and then we manipulate one of the objects, we break one of the constraints, and then the system has to move all of the other objects around. It's, it's allowed to move anything except the one you just moved in order to satisfy the constraints. All right, so in the paper we looked at uh, you solving these problems using numerical optimization. We've looked at a lot of different methods, and so this is another piece in the puzzle. Right. Okay, so uh, as far as I'm aware, humans have, have really uh, discovered two main families of, of ways of solving these sort of spatial problems. One branch is axiomatic methods, and the other is analytic so axiomatic methods work by having prim primitives and rules, and then solving things using theorem proving, uh, basically. Analytic approaches encode spatial constraints using polynomials. Okay, so they translate the problem into another domain, and then they apply polynomial constraint solvers. So numerical optimization falls in this branch, the analytic side. I just want to give you a feeling for what that means, and so we have this sort of qualitative idea of left of, right? And so perhaps what we mean is that this point P3 is on that side of this uh, line segment going from P1 to P2. Uh, we can express that as a polynomial constraint, which looks like this. The details, of course, don't matter. But it looks something like this, where each of the objects is uh, assigned these variables. If we're able to plug in numbers into these variables, then that spatial constraint is satisfiable. Another example, so we might have two circles or two spheres and we want to define the partially overlapping constraints, so PO. Uh, again, it looks something like that, 
details don't matter. The point is that we've translated the problem into this different domain, right? Okay, so we had our axiomatic and analytic branches, and then within each of these branches, there's many, many different methods. Uh, here, so there's symbolic. In the, on the analytic side, there's symbolic, uh, iterative, constructive. There, there are even others. And so numerical optimization falls in this iterative category. Okay, and so the basic idea, I, and again, I guess most of you have, have, are familiar with these methods, at least from high school, right? Maybe if you haven't come across them since then, um, we can go over them quickly now. So the idea of iterative methods is that you produce better and better uh, answers and hopefully converge on some sort of real, actual solution, right? That's the, that's the basic principle. Uh, convergence is not guaranteed by these approaches. And so roughly the, the idea is you guess to begin with and then you check to see whether you just happen to randomly solve the problem by, by guessing. If not, then you nudge your objects a little bit closer to being solved and you check, have I solved it yet? No, and you keep nudging and so on. Okay, so I looked on, um, oh yeah, well I was gonna say I looked on Wikipedia and they had a really nice little gif that we'll show now, again, just to sort of get the, the idea across. And so Newton's root finding method is very um, popular iterative approach. So let's imagine we have our equation. We can pretend that this could have encoded some spatial constraint. It doesn't in this case, but uh, the task is to find values for x such that that constraint is satisfied, right? Okay, so this blue line is uh, the function, sort of the, all of the, the answers. We plug x in, then we get all of these values um, for our equation along the blue line. We don't have direct access to that. What we're looking for is an x that us that one, right? And so how do we uh, proceed? So first, the system will just randomly pick an x. Okay, so imagine it picked this x, then it'll plug it into the equation and see what number it gets out. Uh, that number doesn't equal zero, so the system knows that much, right? And so then it tries to improve that result by picking another x, and in the case of Newton's method, it uses this uh, derivative, okay? So it slides down the derivative and finds where it crosses that line and then says, okay, let's try that value as our next value. So if we move along a little bit, okay, so then we would end up trying this value, uh, plug it in, see what uh, value our equation gives there. Still not zero, keep going. Oops, went past zero, now we're in a negative number. So better go backwards, okay, and then keep going, keep going, keep going, and then eventually, hopefully, we'll arrive here. Okay, and so notice that um, as we plugged in different x's, sometimes we were above zero and sometimes we were below zero. Okay. Uh, even in this context, we can think of spatial consistency, right? So spatial consistency would, would, would be finding x's that cross that line. Uh, instantiation then is simply the value of x as, as it, um, it equals zero, right? So that, that's how we could understand our spatial reasoning problems in terms of uh, root finding. But again, notice that some of the x's give us positive values and some negative. We can do a really simple trick, well known within geometric constraint solving, where, uh, for example, you can just square your equation, right? So now, no matter what value of x we plug in, it's always going to be a positive number. And so now we can reformulate this or rethink about, think about this in a different way. It's no longer root finding, but an optimization problem, right? So we're trying to find an x that minimizes our function. Why would we do that? It uh, happens that it's, it happens to just be an easier problem to solve. There's many, many, many different uh, numerical optimization algor algorithms available. Okay. And so the final formulation looks something like this, where each of our constraints is some function f. Okay, so here we've got m constraints. We've got x. x is no longer one variable, but a vector of variables. Okay. So if I've got one circle, then that requires maybe three variables. So I've got the x and the y and the r. If I've got 10 circles, then that would require 30 variables, right? So that would be a vector of 30 different values. Uh, we square all of these different uh, equations and then uh, sum the value all together and then try to minimize that. Okay, this is a very, very classic, simple least squares uh, formulation. And it's interesting, from a spatial reasoning perspective, perspective, it's very interesting indeed. Okay, so, here we go, I'll do this a bit slower. Uh, so in this example, whoops, don't like that. <laughs> okay, well, 
I'm having trouble pausing it. But here, the idea, right, you can see the sort of analogy. So before, we were jumping around with our x uh, on, on this curve. And now, by analogy, we've got all of these different variables, and each uh, answer corresponds to a configuration that either solves or doesn't solve the problem. So here, the problem is on the left, we want four circles all touching each other. And we can see that in the beginning, we guessed, right? We just threw them down. And then numerical optimization starts to move them closer to solving the problem, right? On the right, we have an inconsistent problem. So here we're saying four circles should all be touching each other externally and all be the same size. Okay, there's no solution to this problem, but still these algorithms give us something, right? They, they still minimize, they find the lowest point to try to minimize all of these constraints. So that's interesting. Uh, no, they don't. No, they don't. And it, yeah, it, that's that's the the draw. I suppose that's the trade-off, right? So we get scalability. So here, it can tackle problems with hundreds of objects. It can it can at least approach them, whereas other me other exact methods literally st struggle with four objects. So sometimes there's a very hard limit. Uh, so you can't solve some problems that have four circles. So here it's scalable, but it doesn't guarantee convergence, right? So that's that's the trade-off. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's sort of that's sort of like our job. So our role is to provide an interface to different relations. Behind the scenes, we can solve it using numerical optimization or exact methods. All the user would see is externally connected or partially overlapping, something like that. Yeah. Uh, it's more it's more general than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, it, these sort of methods can handle all sorts of interesting problems. So it's just non-linear uh, non numerical optimization, multi-variable numerical optimization. Yeah. It's a very mature field. There's lots of different methods that, that have been developed, different algorithms. Okay. Um, we can also then look, so we can get some insight into the solving process, right? So here, if anyone's familiar with um, Pat Hayes' work on space-time histories, this maybe gets something towards it so we can string all of the different intermediate solutions together and see that itself as, as some sort of object in a one dimension higher. Okay. Uh, so yeah, just to, to summarize in contrast with the other approaches, so iterative methods uh, give us instantiation and mixed numerical qualitative reasoning, which is nice, uh, although not unique, so other approaches do that. Uniquely, I think, it gives interactive geometry. So I don't know how you can do interactive geometry with symbolic, maybe with constructive. It gives us a best found solution, though. This is perhaps the most interesting part. And so for problems that are over-constrained or they're not satisfiable, we at least get something, right? It can, it can help us solve those problems. And it's fast. Okay, I've, I've list, left that a little bit loose. We can discuss that in questions uh, if we like. Okay, but it's incomplete for consistency, so as, as we already discussed, which means it doesn't guarantee convergence, which means that there may be a consistent problem where the system doesn't know that it's consistent or it can't find a solution. Okay, it's, it's, uh, it's sound for, so if it produces a consistent result, that's definitely consistent. We can verify that because it gives us the, the configuration. Okay, but if it, says, if it says inconsistent, we can't be sure that the problem is really inconsistent. All right, um, another part of the paper was showing how we can use this within a system like Prolog without messing up um, SLD resolution or anything like that. Uh, the, the basic idea is that you store the spatial graph within Prolog. Whenever the spatial graph changes, then you encode the whole problem in this numerical optimization framework, solve it, and then throw away everything. And that works just fine. Um, the, the reason is that uh, these sort of systems measure complexity based on iterations. And so if you give it a problem that's already solved, it knows it very, very quickly. So that's sort of sort of the key to how this works. And it works really nicely. And so I'm, I'm very happy with this sort of um, solver, with this, this way of solving these problems. All right, so just to wrap up in my last two minutes, I can see you're grabbing two minute sign. I just wanted to quickly go over some applications that we've been looking at. So one thing, uh, actually uh, on Monday I'll be going to the qualitative reasoning workshop and presenting uh, this work that I did with four other colleagues on, so it's in the area of education and to do with solar eclipses and recognizing that people are often a little bit 
iffy on how, what, what are the sort of physics or the mechanics of solar eclipses and how does that relate to seasons and so on, or does it relate at all? And if, when people are trying to explain these concepts, they often draw diagrams like this, which are very qualitative, right? There's, there's no scale involved, nothing like that, but there's certain qualitative relationships that are key to communicate this uh, topic. And so we could then express these diagrams, just isolate those qualitative spatial relationships, define these sort of diagrams, so like a top-down perspective of our solar system and a from-Earth perspective, define qualitative relationships that connect these two diagrams so that we can sort of manipulate this one and see this other diagram moving around. That works pretty well. Okay, it looks something like this. So we have our points and circles, and we say that the center of the moon orbit is the Earth and, and so on. Uh, we can define our states in the same way, so we can, we can build up prolog rules to do with, uh, for example, the penumbra that mix spatial relations, right? So now it's, it's really like uh, spatial reasoning natively within prolog. Okay, and so finally, uh, another topic then is the smart meeting cinematography. This uh, video is actually pretty old now, um, but the idea here is that we want to define certain actions and events that happen within this sort of framework, right? And so here we've got a connect device and picking up readings and then translating these readings into or trying to interpret these readings according to rules. Okay. All right, and so again, just, just to finish up, I, I just wanted to talk about the trajectory in, uh, in case it sort of um, picks up something in your mind. So we, we sort of began this work around 2011 with the COSIT paper. Over the next few years, we were working on various different approaches for solving spatial problems within this context. Uh, then, uh, at some point, we presented work that applied this in architectural design. Most, more recently, we've looked at uh, applying the same ideas, but with an answer set programming, so getting non-monotonic spatial reasoning, and most recently, looking at applying the same ideas with systems like Problog, so getting probabilistic spatial reasoning. Okay, and so th there are, um, we're going to be giving a tutorial at ECHI, so if anyone's attending, then please come. Uh, also, if you are interested in pursuing this further or you want to see whether we can uh, work together or if you want to maybe introduce some of these topics within a course that you're running for students, then just come and talk to me. I'm, I'm doing it now and it's, it's really good fun. Students have really interesting ideas about how to teach people about different stuff. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, it works to totally fine. And so as long as you can express this polynomial constraint, then it works, which again, which is also something which I'm very happy with, right? So uh, often you want to project objects onto surfaces, and if you can describe that as a polynomial constraint, then you can just plug that into these numerical optimization systems and they work. Uh, yeah, so this analytic line is, is pretty cool, actually. Yeah, yeah, it's good for some things. Yeah. It reminded me a little bit as an old Right, that's a, that's a great reference. Yeah, I'll definitely check it out. So Juno, Juno it's system by Nelson. Yeah. He's, he's dead now, but uh, ah. that is uh, Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for the... Uh, sure, yeah, thanks but, for the point. But, I mean, yours seems to be much more advanced, so more, more objects. Uh, uh, only because within computational geometry, there's probably been a lot of progress. Each couple of years, there's there's huge improvements, right? So if we can hijack those improvements and then reformulate them and then plug them into KR frameworks, I think we've got a good, <laughs> good arrangement. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions? No. I have a 
was she going to win? Would you not recommend using this kind of system? Like maybe in mission critical cases, I don't know, but mm. where would you use it? Would you recommend not, not using it? I guess. <coughs> yeah. Uh, in cases where you don't need objects to move. And so some, some scenarios, you just have everything fixed and you just want to read in numerical information. Mm. But even then it might be useful to, to define uh, sort of, into, so maybe you want to detect the cross section, mm. right? And you know that your data is somehow clean and, and refined. You still would want these layers mm. to, to sort of interpret that data. Uh, I mean, the, the numerical optimization in particular, uh, the thing is that pe I, I think people within uh, like search and rescue and so on do use these sort of methods. They just have ways of uh, sort of really confirming that they're not going to fall into this area where the system just uh, gets stuck. Right. Yeah. Um, the reason is they're so scalable. Mm -hmm. So if you want to do anything practical with real world data, mm -hmm. you, have, you probably have to go for methods in that direction. You can't hope for sound and complete reasoning. Just, I mean, so the complexity of sound and complete reasoning in this context is doubly exponential. Okay, so that's 2 to the power of 2 to the power of n. Mm -hmm. So that's why uh, this is to do with quantifier elimination and the algorithm, cylindrical algebraic decomposition, mm -hmm. if anyone's familiar with that. Uh, yeah, and so this is why you, with top n systems, you get stuck on like four circles, and it becomes tricky to do anything with, with more than that. So they do have a very important function, but it's in combination with these other systems. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Great, thank you.